Okay, so um, thank you for the invitation. Um, um, uh, and yeah, good morning or good evening. Uh, it's it's just about morning here. It's nine o'clock um, here in Belgium, so um, it's morning. <laughs> um, so today I'll be talking about arthropod associated fungi in um, a class of of poorly studied taxa, the label Benyomyceres. Um, so I'm Danny Hillwaters. Um, I'm a postdoc at Ghent University in Belgium, but I'm also associated with the Universidad Autónoma de Chiriqui in Panama and with the University of South Bohemia in the Czech Republic. Um, so let's imagine that um, all of the um, diversity of fungi, the estimated species diversity of fungi is this black slide. If this is the case, then we have described in 300 years that tiny box. Um, so in, in real numbers, that's about 130. 5,000 described species, which sounds a lot, but is, is really a little compared to the 6 million species we estimate to be out there of fungi. And so fungi are, are very diverse. You have these tiny um, <clears throat> Leosia-like things in, in Africa, um, arthropod-associated herpomyces, um, sclerotinia rots, um, those are on the sunflowers. These are galls uh, that we call cytaria that are only associated with notophagus, also a parasite. This is Pseudogymnoascus destructans, what's causing the white nose syndrome, um, depleting populations of bats in North America, etc., etc., etc. So um, many diversity out there. And so, as I said, we only described 135,000 species of fungi um, compared to, you know, between 600,000 and 10 million um, but the, the latest number is about 6 million species that we estimate to be out there. And so the diversity that we do not know yet, we refer to as the fungal dark matter. So we already know that there are some clades out there, but we haven't described them yet because we do not have any specimens. So we can detect them through high throughput sequencing methods, but we have no specimen material. So we, we are not able to describe them. Um, so in my research, I um, aim to what I refer to as push the boundaries of fungal exploration. And I do this under three umbrella themes. So I study understudied fungi and understudied habitats. Part of that is studying the label Biniomyceres fungi. And then within the label Biniomyceres, I study multitrophic interactions. So I, I'd like to briefly introduce each of these um, three themes. <clears throat> So let's start with the understudied fungi and understudied habitats. So when we think about understudied habitats, we usually think about the jungle um, and, and tropical rainforests where we can where we can go out and, and find undescribed species of, of all kinds of organisms, really. But um, another habitat that I like to think of as understudied, which is much closer at home, even in your grocery stores, is lettuce. Um, and that's really interesting. But we found that we do not know what is the fungal microbiota on lettuce. So we started to study this in depth at Purdue University, where I was my where was my previous um, position. So the reason we started studying this is because it's a it's a really fast growing crop in the United States. It's consumed raw, and because it is consumed raw, it is prone to infections um, by human pathogens like Escherichia coli. And so in 2018, there was an outbreak and, and people got infected through across 36 U.S. states and some people died. And so this gives us some rationale to studying the, the microbiota on there so we can see if there's any relationships between the fungi that are naturally occurring on the lettuce um, leaf surfaces and some of these human pathogens. And so the, the way we did this, we went basically to just grocery stores. We bought lettuces. We mashed them up in a solution, then we diluted them. Um, we made plates of filamentous and of yeast-like fungi, and then we also made aliquots um, for next-generation sequencing. So we did Sanger sequencing, next-generation sequencing, and in both cases, we focused on the fungal barcode, which is the internal transcribed species region. And we found in our Sanger sequencing approach that there were 63 species on our um, on our um, leaf surfaces of these um, romaine lettuces. And what was really interesting here is that the most 
isolated species was a red yeast shown here in the left bottom corner a red yeast um, that was undescribed so there you have it you have an undescribed species that we do not know um, that we haven't characterized we don't know its interactions with anything else and we eat it on a daily basis because it's on one of the most popular crops around the world and so um, this this new species we actually compared it to existing environmental sequences around the world and we did see that it's actually widespread with um, um, with other sequences from the US South America lots of sequences in Europe Africa and also Asia our next generation sequencing approach led us to 630 OTUs which you can think of as um, species and we found that the microbial community is very different in conventionally treated samples and in organically treated samples so there is some sort of an influence of the management regime of these lettuces um, which is really interesting to look at in the future so let us go to the uh, label binomycetes which is the topic of the talk um, the reason that i put this elephant here uh, that says ignore me is this is the proverbial elephant in the room right all of the mycologists around the world um, well I would say know that the label binomycetes are out there and what they are but nobody really studies them like there's a handful and that's probably an overestimation of people studying these things um, and so that's why I like to refer them as the proverbial elephant in the room um, so there are three described orders in the class label binomycetes um, there's also a few other clades um, <clears throat> that I'll briefly highlight in a minute. Uh, so the order Pixidophorelis is a complicated order of mycoparasites. So these are fungi that parasitize other fungi. They both have a sexual and an asexual morph. They're hyphal, which is you know typical for most of the fungi, and they they are not very diverse. There are about 22 described species, but um, um, a lot of diversity is probably undescribed yet. Um, so their mm, habitat requirements um, are most, well, in, for some species, herbivore dung, which is really interesting. So they grow on herbivore dung. This is actually a patch of moose dung that I collected myself in New Hampshire. It was on a holiday, I should say. Um, but I saw it and I uh, collected it and I found Pixidiophora um, um, peritesia. Um, so they do also require a mite in their life stage, uh, in their life cycle. Uh, the, the mite picks up the ascospores, the ascospores develop on the mites um, into an anamorphic state, which we refer to as taxteriola, and then the anamorphic state that can then gets um, dispersed by the mite to another ephemeral substrate, such as this, this dung. Um, to then become a new um, peritheseum again. So there's a complicated life cycle that needs fungi and then an arthropod for dispersal. Then the order label Binielis and the order Herpomycetales are also arthropod associated, but different in, in such a way that they are actually um, ectoparasites. So they occur on the body of the, of the um, arthropods. So here is a um, Hesperomyces, um, different thala of Hesperomyces on a ladybug. And then these are different uh, thalli of herpomyces here as well on um, a cockroach. <clears throat> Interesting about these two orders is they do not have a described asexual stage. Um, they do not have hyphae. Instead, they have individual thalli, <clears throat> which is a three-dimensional um, fruiting body. The diversity of the label Binielis is high with 2,200 described species, although we estimate um, that there are about 75 thousand or up to 75,000 species. <coughs> What's really interesting is that more than half of these species have been described by one single person. So 1,250 species were described by Roland Baxter, who was a professor at Harvard. Um, so his, his papers are still uh, cited by um, the community uh, on, a, on a regular basis. So there are some practical constraints in studying these um, label Pinomycetes fungi, and this is why the label Pinomycetes have been historically neglected by the broader uh, mycological uh, community. So, if you think about this line being one millimeter, then the average size is this thallus, so about 200 uh, micrometer in size. 
The tiny thallus at the right of the larger thallus is another species that we frequently find on ants, and that's their regular size, their average size, so about 40 micrometer. So you're thinking, you're speaking about tiny organisms. And also, this is the whole organism. There's nothing else. There's no mycelium. There's no um, below ground or, or under the surface structures. Uh, this is it. So in addition to that is they do not grow in culture. So we can't grow them on agar like other fungi. Um, for some species in the Pixidia ferialis, then you need co-culturing techniques. So it becomes very complicated to get them in culture. But then when it works, of course, you do have material to work with. DNA extractions have been problematic. And that is because the melanin seems to interfere with PCR. The melanin is, is the, um, the, the, the um, composite that is um, present in the cell walls of the Labobinieli thalli. And also the thalli themselves are very rubbery, so we can't break them open easily. And then um, the last point is that a single host can carry multiple species of Labobinielis or Herpomycetelis. A single host can carry multiple morphotypes of different species or multiple morphotypes of the same species. And this is why it gets really complicated. You can't just scrape off all of the um, Labobinielis thalli on a single host and then do a massive DNA extraction. You need a single thallus for DNA extractions, which makes it really hard. Because, because they're so small. So here is an example of a, um, a water beetle, a um, Lacophilus in the family Dittiscidae. So we're looking at the uh, epipleuron right here. So this is the epipleuron, uh, the line here through the screen. And then so at the bottom, towards um, the ventral side, you have a species that's really fattened, Chitonomyces paradoxus. Towards the dorsal end, you have this species with a hook, with a blackened hook. And then we refer to this as Chitonomyces italicus. But these are, of course, morphologically described species. They differ morphologically. You can see that pretty clearly. But the question is, are they actually different species? Because you have to see how closely related, how closely uh, to each other that they are attached to the body. So there is some, some reason to believe that this may be one and the same species, um, but we need DNA um, proof for this. So there are some challenging challenges in studying this group of fungi. There is a huge sampling bias in that there are only 2,000 species described, and we estimate up to 75,000 species, which means that if we make phylogenetic reconstructions, that our sampling, that our data set is going to be heavily biased. So there is, um, there is a lot of clades missing, which really accounts for low support values and long branches. Um, in addition, many of these 2,000 described species have only been found a single time, um, and, and so um, we need to go out and collect more specimens. Um, there is this host specificity issue. There is many taxa that are described with many, many hosts and wide distributions, which is a problem of itself because there are reasons to believe that these microscopic taxa with multiple hosts and almost global distributions are more than one species and so I'll, I'll talk about that in a little bit. There's a lack of molecular phylogenetic data, there's less than 700 sequences on GenBank which is very little for a whole class and then there's the dependency on morphology so there's only six species described using sequence data. So these are all the species described um, in um, a time span of 10 years, 11 years um, and there's only a few, six that have been described using sequence data. So, so there's quite some work to be done. Um, we can collect Labobinielis locally in many different places and ways. Um, even close at home, you can go to your attics or um, <clears throat> in, the, um, in the windows, um, in the framework of windows, you can find ladybirds that are often infected with, with Labobinielis thalli. You can go to the basement, find lots of cockroaches. Um, you can screen insect collections in museum, which is something that I like to do myself. Um, I collected lots of ladybugs in citrus plantations. Um, you can open up um, nests of um, um, ants and termites to then screen them for Labobinielis. You can find them in, you can collect with a net. Um, insects in high grasses, um, salt marshes, you can collect them in um, oops, <clears throat> uh, decomposing flowers 
And then also I um, go out to the field and capture bats. Um, and then the bats, they have ectoparasitic flies, which then are hosts to the label being my cities. So um, there are a number of advances in studying these uh, fungi, and I'll be talking about them, um, uh, about each of these. So the first one is integrative taxonomy. Um, which really means that we're not just using morphology, but we're using all of the evidence available in uh, delineating species diversity. So we're using morphology, morphometrics analysis, if we can, which is which is using uh, sizes and shapes in a statistical uh, framework. Uh, we're using um, sequence data. We're using ecological data, um, and etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So, and here are the other ways which I'll be talking about um, later on. So, um, integrative taxonomy, I applied this to uh, the species Hespermyces ferricens. So, this is a species that occurs on um, um, ladybirds, for example, Harmonia exhibitis, uh, which is an invasive um, ladybird in, in uh, North America and, and Europe. Uh, it was introduced as a biological control agent, but then it became a pest species on its own, um, pushing away native ladybirds. Um, basically around the world. So Hesperomyces ferricens not only occurs on harmonia exhibitis, but it also occurs on many different um, species within all of these um, um, genera of ladybirds. And so this, this provided me the rationale in actually going out to the field, collecting different ladybirds on different continents, different places of the world, and then trying to find if uh, their Hesperomyces ferricens isolates were all the same uh, species or not. So I went out, um, this was during my PhD at Harvard, so I, I collected lots of ladybirds in the United States, but also uh, collected specimens in Panama, started a collaboration in South America, uh, South Africa where I collected two species, um, also collected in Europe and had collaborations in Europe where we collected several species and then also obtained species from um, specimens from Japan. And so in the end, I collected um, specimens of different species of ladybirds. Uh, many of them were infected. Several of them were infected with Hesperomyces. I obtained sequences of Hesperomyces from three gene regions, and then I put all of these sequences in a concatenated data set and then made a tree of this. Uh, this is a beast uh, tree with uh, maximum parsimony and maximum likelihood uh, support values plotted on them. And so each of these clades represents um, multiple isolates of Hesperomyces taken from a single host. So each clade is color-coded by host. And so this really um, points to the idea that there is divergence uh, within Hesperomyces by, or, or segregation by host, right? And so I, I went ahead and then applied species delimitation methods like ABGD, PTP, GMYC, where I asked the question whether these clades represented populations are actual species. And so in the, in the majority of cases, all of these clades seem to represent um, an actual species. So this really points to the idea that Hesperomyces fluorescens is not a species, but a complex of multiple species, each species on a single host of ladybird. And so um, this is some of the diversity, the morphological diversity that we're seeing on these different hosts. And so when applying a morphometric approach, um, we can see that there is um, that these three structures, so this single cell here, cell one, this is the cell carrying the peritheum, cell six, and then this is the peritheum proper, that these three structures are actually significantly different among thalli from different hosts. So if I were to describe these as Hesperomyces as individual species, I would focus on these three structures. I also did a um, molecular clock. Um, analysis using two calibration points. So I used the Metacapnodiaceae ISPA, uh, which is located here, at, um, which roots the tree at 100 million years. And I also used Sigmatomyces zucchini, which is in the label Binium my series, uh, which um, then um, rooted the tree at 35 million years. And I found that the age of Hesperomyces is pretty young. It's less than 25. Um, million years, um, and I do have to do more analysis to figure out if this um, is in relationship with the divergence of the hosts, although I think the hosts were diverged much earlier. 
All right, so the second thing we could do is doing these controlled laboratory bioassays, which we did very recently um, for the first time in this, in this um, <clears throat> group of fungi and pointed at some interesting results. So we asked the question whether Hesperomyces um, can affect the mortality or the survival of its host. We, have, we tested that on two ladybirds, the, invasion, the invasive Asian ladybird, Harmonia series, and then a North American native ladybird and then so we um, infected the Asian ladybird with Hesperomyces, we infected the native ladybird with Hesperomyces, and then we also infected uh, these ladybirds with an entomopathogenic uh, fungus, just to see what the result was or what the relationship was between Hesperomyces and the entomopathogenic fungus if you apply a dual fungal infection. And so these are the results. So when not infected, when infected with Hesperomyces fericens, the mortality of Hermonia exhibitis is quite increased up to 50%. You see the same thing in all of Inigrum. The mortality is increased, although not as much. Then um, using these dual infections, so Hesperomyces fericens using a, um, a commercial strain of Bovaria bassiana, using Metarhizium anisopliae and then using a native strain of Bavaria bassiana, bassiana, the mortality is equally high as when only infected with Hespermyces virus. And so is, there is no additive effect, which is, which is an interesting result, right? On the contrary, um, with Olavinigrum, all of these dual infections seem to point at a much higher mortality. And I didn't plot here the p-values, but these differences in mortality are significant. So there is a significantly more mortality in olivinigrum um, under dual infections compared to Harmonia exhibitis. And for this one, for the Metarhizium, it's almost 100%. I think there was only one ladybird alive after the, after the experiment was done. We also looked at the chance of survival after dual infections and saw that the um, <clears throat> native ladybirds um, had less probabilities to survive after 15 days compared to the native ladybird. And again, this was significant. And so this really is, is in line with the anime release hypothesis that states that specimens are species that invade a new area, undergo less pressure from natural enemies compared to the native um, um, species. And so this, is, this seems to be the case here. Um, where the native ladybird has more pressure um, from the natural enemies compared to the invasive one. All right, so the third thing, um, a, a third advance or um, advancing approach is where we apply um, automated image processing and uh, statistics in looking at whether a light roll color, color pattern sizes of ladybirds and the sex of ladybirds have an effect on, in, on infection by Hesperomyces virusens. We had a big data set of ladybirds collected from a locality in Massachusetts, and so we asked this question. But then we were looking for a way to study this as, as proper as possible, and so we designed a macro um, in an image processing software package where we looked at these different um, um, and elytra. So we, we loosened the elytra from the ladybirds, then we, wrote, we designed a region of interest. This was something we did by hand, but then we made binary pictures and then we made the program select the uh, spots itself and then calculate automatic, in an automatic way the um, surface of the spots, the surface of the region of interest, which is the entire elytra, and then all of the analyses that, that come later, where we look at all of these different traits and then trying to relate these traits with infection prevalence and infection intensity. And we did find, for example, that elytral area is actually significant, is an, a significant factor in uh, the infection prevalence and in the infection intensity. So it seems that smaller ladybirds um, have more infection of um, labopinigillis. And this may be that smaller ladybirds have um, a lesser functioning immune system, eh, or they may be more active um, because of which they may have more interactions with other ladybirds so they can get more opportunities to get infected by Hesperomyces. The fourth um, strategy is, is thinking about visualization um, approaches. So 
we used we usually just use simple live microscopy, but then um, in this case we are looking at a um, species, a specimen in uh, in amber. This is Dominican amber with a thallus of uh, Columnomyces. Um, but with live microscopy, whatever you do, um, I'm not showing you the pictures because they're horrible. But whatever you do, you cannot see any details. Um, however, with an X-ray approach, we actually were able to see a lot of um, detail and this is just one of the videos that we made. Uh, we also have multiple pictures where we are also able to look at the inner side of the thallus. We we're able to see all of the little details. We were able, we were able to describe um, this whole thallus um, in detail because of this new technique which is really cool um, because it's really one important step forward in studying these uh, fungi because now even if we find them in really dark amber, we still have the approaches to describe them formally. Then phylogenetic analyses, which have been applied since, you know, 20, 30 years in the lab of Biniomycetes, but we really need to start doing it in, an, in a way that's, 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 um, that's appropriate uh, for the time. And so we have to use these multi-locus data sets, which is really difficult because there's not a lot of data available. But for one of my projects, I was able to collect many uh, specimens of Herpomyces. So Herpomyces is the the um, <clears throat> genus um, that's associated with cockroaches. Um, they're often on the antenna. Um, and so we went out to the field, collected cockroaches. We also ordered cockroaches. This is a really fun way to actually get easy access to Herpomyces. We ordered cockroaches from pet stores, from online stores, um, from laboratories. And most of them were actually infected with Herpomyces. It's an interesting observation. Um, so I um, extracted DNA, uh, generated sequences, and then made this tree where we actually, for the first time, provided the support for the idea that Herpomyces is not part of the Labobini elis. So it was always thought to be part of the Labobini elis, but it is actually not. It's highly supported as its own order, and there's also um, ultrastructural support, support from development, etc., that I'm not going to go in depth in right now. But there is enough support to actually describe this as a as an order. So we described the Herpomycetales two years ago, which seems to be a sister order of the Pixidiophrales. This on its own is also interesting, because if Herpomycetales and Labobinielis do not have a um, a single um, ancestor, it means that uh, our that this is not a monophyletic clade, it means that the thallus formation, this thing that's really unique of this class, has a dual, um, an independent, two independent origins, which is interesting on its own. We did a two locus analysis in a tiny tree here. I'm sorry that, that, I, that this is shown so small, but again, Herpomyces is supported, uh, highly supported as an order. Um, but then this is the Pixidiophorelis, the Labobinielis, there are sister orders. But then these are two other clades, Labobiniopsis and Cantranciopsis. These are more clades that are part of the Labobiniomycetes, clades of fungi that we do not understand. So Cantranciopsis is actually associated with termites. It's a very simple asexual fungus. Um, so you, you, you would say, why not describe the order? But then we find that Subaromyces, which is a perithecial fungus uh, that we find in wastewater treatments, um, is also part of this clade. So we really do not understand the life history, the life cycle of these fungi. So we're, we haven't described these orders formally. We did do a six locus phylogeny, Ascomycota wide, where we're able to place the level Biniomycetes within all of the um, classes of the phylum Ascomycota. We were able for the first time to find a high support for this node here, which we refer to as a level Biniomyceta. And this node really represents the single origin of Perithecia of fungi. And so the Perithecium is this enclosed fruiting structure uh, that forms these acai um, uh, with ascospores that then can leave the structure through a single opening. So that was nice as well. So in all of these years, um, we actually only published four trees of Labobiniomycetes, um, and they're all pretty contrasting, right? So depending on the data set you're using, depending on the number of characters, depending on the number of um, um, isolates include, you have all these contrasting um, <clears throat> evolutionary hypotheses, and it also, um, there's also not 
support in several places. So this really shows us that we, we have a long way to go and uh, we need to, to continue our efforts to sample more characters and sample more specimens. All right, getting to the last um, umbrella theme is a multitrophic interaction. So I study um, bats um, and the bats are hosts to bat flies and then the bat flies are parasites, but they're hosts themselves for these fungal parasites. And so let me introduce this system a little bit. So bats are the second most diverse groups of, of, of mammals. There are about 1,300 species worldwide. Uh, and as a comparison, there are 47 species in the USA, but there's 118 species in Panama, which is a much smaller country, right? There's 74 species on BCI, which is the Bar Bar which is a single island, Barra Colorado Island. And there's 112 species in Honduras, is where I do um, a long-term inventory project right now. So, so there's a lot of diversity out there in uh, the neotropics. They're unique in their flight and nocturnal life cycle or lifestyle. Um, they have echolocation. In their sociality, they vary from solitary to um, aggregations of millions of individuals. In their roosting behavior, they vary from ephemeral, uh, making these leaf tents, to permanent uh, roosts uh, where they make use of existing caves or tunnels. Um, and all of these characters make them prone to um, parasitism by different um, organisms or arthropods. And so we have the hemipterans, uh, the bugs, you have the siphonopterans, the uh, lice, um, and then you have akari, which are the mites. Most of them are infected by these. So here's me holding a, a Pteranotus mesoamericanus bat in Panama. And so this is um, infected with many specimens of bat flies, uh, probably a species of Trichobius. And so bat flies are um, in um, classified in two orders, uh, sorry, two uh, families, Stribilidae and Nycteribidae, although this is an old classification that's subject to change. So Stribilidae seems to be a, a paraphyletic family, so there needs to be a taxonomic change here. The blood-sucking um, um, arthropods, they occur in the fur and on the wing membranes. They're semi-permanent um, with adaptations to keep them associated with their bat hosts. So we have Nycteribidae with 80% of the species that are occurring in the Eastern Hemisphere, and then we have the Strebilidae with 70% of species that occur in Central and South America, in the Neotropics. And so these are, um, this is a specimen of a Nycteribid, and so we often refer to Nycteribids as a spider flies, because they're dorsally, ventrally, dorsal, dorsal, ventrally flattened, um, and they do not have wings. So they, they, they are often mistaken as spiders, so we refer to them as spider flies. So it seems that roosting behavior of the bat hosts affect parasitism um, with bat flies. And so uh, this was found by analyses of specimens from the Smithsonian Venezuela project. This was a project that was run for three years, during which 25,000 bats were collected, uh, from which 36,000 bat flies were, were taken. Um, and it was found that more um, permanent roosting more, more permanently roosting bats had more bat flies, more species of bat flies, and more numbers of bat flies. So, so all of the different levels of parasitism were higher in these bats with a, with a more permanent roosting behavior. The bat flies themselves now can be infected by fungi. So here is a fungus that we newly described, uh, Gloendromyces dickii, recognized by this flap here that you can see on the perithecium. Um, this is the same specimen of bat fly, which we flipped around, and on the wings you see also thalli. Um, <coughs> and this is a different species of, um, of Gloendromyces. So there are four uh, genera, Arthrorhynchus. Uh, this only occurs on bat flies in um, Europe, Asia, um, Australia and Africa. Nycteromyces occurs pretty much worldwide. Chloandromyces only occurs in the Neotropics and Antimeromyces occurs in the Old World. So um, we have this integrated framework of research where we look at... Can you still hear me? Yes, we can still hear you. Oh, okay. 
All right, thank you. Sorry, there was suddenly uh, some sound. Okay, so we designed this integrated framework where we um, think about different questions um, in this in this project, and everything really starts from an integrative taxonomy approach, where we, once you know um, about speciation or speciation species delimitation, you can think about cryptic diversity. You can think about diversity. You can make phylogenies. You can imply um, thinking about host shifts. You can think about coevolutionary patterns between the fungi and their hosts, host associations and specificity. And then one of the questions that I'm mostly interested in with this question, traits, biotic and abiotic traits affecting parasitism. So um, a few things to highlight here is that um, we place the different genera that I collected in a phylogenetic tree. This is just SSU, um, although we do have more data, but I'm just showing SSU tree here. But we do find proof that uh, parasitism of bat flies by level Benelis arose three times independently. So we have Arthorhynchus, Nycteromyces, and then a large plate of Gloendromyces. <laughs> the hypothesis, though, is that Arthorhynchus, this here, this clade here, and Nycteromyces, the clade below here, has evolved, both have evolved independently from lineages of ectoparasites on true bugs. Uh, and true bugs are hemipterans. And why do I say this? Is because those two clades have, um, they're placed sister to clades that occur on bugs. And bugs occur in bat roosts as well. So there is some rational to believe that there has been um, a host shift and that this host shift may have happened twice independently. So this is a hypothesis that one of my students will be working on uh, during a PhD project. We are also looking at cryptic diversity within Arthorhynchus. So here is one of these uh, nycteribid bat flies. This is a um, Penicillidia conspicua. And again, it looks a little bit like a spider because it doesn't have wings. Um, and it has a whole tuft of thalli of Arthorhynchus. So we looked at Arthorhynchus eucampsipode on eucampsipoda and on nycteribia. The, the thalli themselves do not differ morphologically, but uh, the uh, DNA sequences seem different and seem to point at uh, cryptic diversity. So cryptic diversity meaning that even though there is no morphological difference, you can, there is still actually speciation that has happened um, because, there, because we do have the proof in the DNA. And, and you'll say, well, you know, this is not a lot, right? There's only four isolates, but you have to know that Arthorhynchus on bat flies, the prevalence is very low, between two and three percent. And then, of course, the prevalence of bat flies on bats is also low, higher, around 50 percent. But still, it means that you have to collect hundreds, if not thousands, of specimens to actually be able to get a lot of Arthorhynchus to then use for DNA extractions. All right, so whenever I collect a bat, I um, <clears throat> I process it in a field, I collect all the bat flies, then I go to the lab, I um, screen the bat flies under the stereoscope. Whenever I find a fungus, I make a slide. And so this is my actual specimen, right? However, you can think about the specimen in terms of extensions. And so the, the primary extension is when you make pictures and when all of the specimen data end up in a, in a database, a herbarium database. Uh, in this case, the Harvard University Herbaria, where this slide, this specific slide is, is deposited. Then you can think about a secondary extension um, for the um, pictures that were made in the field, the isolate um, with DNA extraction, um, a sequence, and then a, a data set with traits that were collected in the field. And then the tertiary extension is then when you make a description, when you have a phylogenetic tree using the sequences that you generated from your specimen, um, and when you have these um, association plots. <coughs> so all in all, you can think about it not just a specimen, but an extended specimen network. And you can use this extended specimen network to answer questions such as, you know, does climate change have an effect on parasitism? And so this is exactly what we're doing in this system. So we're building a biological traits database um, to answer this question. What's the effect of habitat? 
what's the effect of bat roosting behavior, but also what's the effect of climate change um, on parasitism. Of course, this question needs these large non-biased data sets, preferably tritrophic, and so this is exactly what we're doing with this biological traits uh, database. So we have around, well, it says 8,000, but I think we're at 12,000 specimens right now. Um, the parasite prevalence is about 4%, I'd say. We have specimens coming in from Costa Rica, from Venezuela, from Honduras. This Venezuela is this um, project from the 60s that, that I talked about before. So we're going to screen these bat flies for fungi um, and then include those in our data set. Um, and so one of the things I'm planning to do starting 2021, or given COVID maybe 2022, is to oversee a project where we will be doing uh, field work in these different places. So in uh, Panama, Honduras, um, Dominica, um, Guyana, <clears throat> Mozambique, uh, Croatia, Romania, and then also Brunei. Um, so we will be doing standardized field work to capture bats, to bring those bats, uh, to, to screen those bats for bat flies, and then screen the bat flies for fungi, and then enter all of the data into our data set. And of course, there is a lot of funding involved here. Croatia Wallacea, um, funding agency in Flanders that funds my postdoc, NSF, the university in Panama, and then um, Texan Expeditions. <clears throat> so here is um, some analyses. Uh, that my master's student, Michiel, did. So Michiel at Leiden University, he um, started doing some work in this data set that we have. This is preliminary data based on uh, the available specimens we have, although I would like to keep building on this. So uh, we built this tritrophic associations plot. So below are the bats, in the middle are the bat flies, and at the top are the label pinealis. Um, so you can find here your different bats bat flies and then a different species of level vinyls. These two values that you can see here, H accent two, that's a community value for um, host specificity. The lower it is, the more generalistic your community is, the higher it is, uh, the more specific. So you'll see that for bat flies, it's pretty high. Um, and you can see indeed that most of the bat flies, are, uh, there is a nice single lineage from a single bat fly to a single bat. There are some mistakes, but uh, some of these mistakes are due to human errors. For example, putting a bat in a bat bag where previously was a bat of a different species with perhaps a bat fly that are still in there. So there may have been some sort of an error occurring because of this. However, you see on the different species of, of, of Labopineal is that they have many different hosts. Um, and then this is to make a distinction between all of the neotropical data we have and then all of the European data that we have. Um, so again, these two arrows show um, the one-on-one -on -one relationship between bat flies and their bat hosts. Uh, these arrows point at the different hosts that Labobinielli seem to have. So this one has as many as one, two, three, four, five, six hosts. Uh, which is kind of crazy for a fungus to have so many different hosts. So <clears throat> this is the life cycle of a bat. So a bat, um, after mating, um, the female nourishes a larva internally. It has a specific gland with which it feeds the larva until its third instar stage. Um, when, it in, when it comes to that stage, it uh, deposits that instar larva as a pre-pupa. <laughs> And then um, the pre-pupa will develop in the roost um, and then it'll emerge a few weeks later. So that time where the female bat fly flies up the bat host and then goes searching a specific spot on the roost wall, during that time um, it, it flies up and there are opportunities um, for, the, for the bat fly to come in contact with other bat flies Con-specific, hetero-specific, and all of that depends on the the area it needs to cross to uh, lay its um, its pre-pupa. And so there there was some research done trying to find how far some bat flies fly. And you'd be surprised; it's not a few centimeters. They fly between three and twenty meters uh, in total. 
um, which is kind of crazy. So the higher the distances they have to um, cross to lay their uh, pre-pupa, the more opportunities there are to come in contact with other bad flies. And then um, this may be um, causing the level being yield its frequency to, to rise. Um, this is a figure showing the different traits that we would like to test. So we would like to see, to look at um, habitat ecology, so open versus closed habitat, abiotic factors, temperature and humidity, um, species factors of bats, species factors of bat flies, um, life history traits such as the roost permanence, roost uh, duration and diet, and also life history traits of the bat flies, so ecomorphology and host specificity. So for this um, presentation, let's look at the roost um, behavior of bats. So the roosting behavior of bats um, goes from, and we talked about this really briefly <laughs> earlier on, goes from very ephemeral, where um, bats make use of leaf dens, like these little cutie pies, um, to uh, bats that make use of hollow um, um, trees, and then bats that make use of existing tunnels or caves. So the caves are the most permanent um, roosting structures, whereas the leaf dens are obviously the least permanent ones. And so here is me holding a Pteranotus bat again. Uh, that we collected, that I collected from these tunnels uh, in Soberania in Panama. And so we did find that the um, predicted probability of infection rises, um, and not only the predicted probability, but also the 95% confidence interval uh, rises, um, going from roosting behavior one up to six. And these, these numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, represent the roosting permanence. So one is, is not permanent, six is very permanent. And so um, this was worked on by my master's student, Michiel. Um, it, it, it's still a work in progress, but it's great that we have these data because it does show that roosting behavior not only has an effect on parasitism of bats by bat flies, but it seems to have an effect on parasitism of bat flies by their level being yielded fungi as well. Um, which is kind of crazy because you do have an effect on these two different levels. And so this really leads me to the acknowledgements. Um, first, I would like to acknowledge uh, the university and, and Alia to invite me to give this talk. But of course, there's many mentors that I'd like to um, acknowledge, collaborators, students, especially Michiel and Iris who are working on this Batfly associated level Benelli system, but also others. Um, collaborators, citizen scientists, field and lab assistants, and then of course funding from different sources. Um, and with this, I, um, I'm more than happy to take any questions. So thank you so much, Dr. Denny, for the <clears throat> talk. It is a very interesting talk, and I think it will open a new windows of opportunity for research in Malaysia and other countries. So now I would like to open for any question. You can post it in the chat box, or you can ask directly by turning on your mic. Hi, uh, Danny. Um, how are you? Good Hello. to see you. Hi, good to yeah. see you in person. Yeah. Yeah. Nice to, nice to meet you. Nice just to meet by, you. Yeah, by, by, by meeting. <laughs> yes, 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 yeah. yeah, finally. So thank you for accepting this invitation to be here. And uh, I'm very grateful for this uh, opportunity to listen uh, to your sharing just now. It's a very, very interesting research topic. And I can see a lot of people in your acknowledgement, a lot of uh, teamwork, a lot of uh, you know, research funding is everywhere from all over the world. This is uh, amazing, amazing. So uh, back to uh, your your uh, presentation just now. So when you present uh, just now, I was wondering about this uh, fungal parasite. Uh, very interesting. Mm -hmm. When Alia showed me the first time that she collected the uh, the psychophagy, the flesh flies with the uh, fungal infection on the abdomen, <laughs> I was totally shocked. You know, I, I have I have I haven't seen uh, this kind of infection before. Uh, although I was working with flies for almost for ten years. Uh, it was my first time. And then I sent a picture to one of the um, taxonomies in Japan, uh, fly taxonomies. And yeah, he, he told me that he didn't know what, what is this uh, <laughs> organism on fly, but he suspects something like a fungus, you know, kind of thing. And then I also asked my uh, postdoc, Dr. Tanya Iwora, who is also here. And she mm -hmm. also said something like uh, maybe a fungal infection. So 
And then I said, okay, why not? We, we, we need to find out what is this, you know? So finally, uh, we, 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 we found you. So thank you so much for helping us. No, of course, yeah. More than that. I don't think um, that the um, infection on flies is much lower compared to anything else. Right. So we did, um, when I started my research in 2011 or so, we did focus on, um, we actually found a fly that was new for the Netherlands and a fungus that was found in the Netherlands for the first time. But it was really interesting because we found the fungus one time on a total of 6,000 flies. So we had to screen 6,000 flies to be able to find a single one infected with one fungus. So that was just crazy, just to give you an idea of how low the, the prevalence is. So good for you that you find the fungus yep. on the uh, sarcophagidae. Right, right. I mean, this is a very, uh, uh, that, that small chance that we finally found uh, this kind of uh, interesting organism. But I would like to ask a question, if you don't mind. Uh, sure. Like, yeah. like would, would you think that the fungal parasite uh, would change the fly's uh, behavior or even the, the fly lifespan? That, that is the question that I really want to know. Sure. Uh, we don't know her right now. Okay. Um, so I, I've shown you the data we have for Hesperomyces on ladybirds. So it does seem to decrease the lifespan. Uh, it seems to increase mortality um, and, and mm. decrease survival rates in, in ladybirds. But you can't just, you know, um, um, say because we studied one species, all of them are going to have the same effect. That's that's not doable. And there's one thing I did that I didn't mention in the talk that Hesperomyces has a hostorium, so it does actually penetrate into the exoskeleton to make contact with the hemosole, and that's from nutrients. But a taxon like um, Stigmatomyces, which is the one that that Alia found on on a, on a, um, on the sarcophagidae, well, many species of stigmatomyces do not have a hostorium like that. So we actually would have to test that in the lab to find out if there's any effect of uh, stigmatomyces. Because I, I, I personally believe that parasitism in level pineales or level, yeah, level pineales and herpomycetales really goes on a continuum from, from non parasitic taxa yeah. to more specific, more parasitic taxa, depending on factors like presence of a hostorium. So, so right now I wouldn't be able to tell you, right. uh, but, but yeah, it's a good question. <laughs> but do you know any reason why the infestation uh, in Diptera is uh, so much lower compared to other uh, uh, organisms? Yeah. Um, well, no, I don't know. We would have to see, we have to look at the life cycle details, life history traits. Mm -hmm. um, I'm sure there's something there, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I know in, in bat flies, we also know that there's very low um, prevalence, like we were talking about 2%. So you would find mm -hmm. two bat flies infected on a total of 100. So in yeah. some flies, it's much, much less. But, you know, as long as as the parasites, um, you know, as long as populations can can continue, I suppose parasites happy. It doesn't need to infect a massive population um, right. in order to survive. So I suppose it's just you know good enough for it to to continue. Uh, so it, it may be a strategy of the parasite itself, mm -hmm. but we don't know right now. We would it, we would have to continue doing you know, a lot of research and, and maybe look into more traits, maybe look at genomic signatures or something like that to, to look, to, to find more aspects of, of parasitism. Sure, sure. Well, thank you so much for your sharing just now. Yeah, thanks. I think I might give the chance to others to ask questions. <laughs> sure, of course. Right. Yeah. yeah, sure. Uh, hi, Danny, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Hi, Tom. Nice to see you. Yeah, good to good to sort of see you in person for the first time. Uh, thanks for your talk. It was really, really interesting um, introduction to this whole new sort of fungal world. Um, sure. I was wondering, with the uh, infected ladybirds, you said that the infected individuals tended to be smaller. Is it possible uh -huh. 
sure that that's a direct effect of the fungus rather than it just being the smaller individuals are more vulnerable. So could it be that, say, um, you know, I don't know whether the fungus survives the um, the transition from larva to adults in the ladybirds, but could it be that they were previously yeah. infected and therefore they didn't grow as big or something? Sure, that's a good question. And there's something there that that, that was my mistake. I didn't mention it. Um, so lavules, they do not infect larvae, so they only infect adults. Okay. So, so that's a good, that's a good, that's a good point. Uh, and thank you for spotting that. Uh, <laughs> so they only infect when when the specimens are already adults. So I wouldn't say this is this yes, is in relation, right? But yeah, okay. great question. Yeah, you cool. didn't know that, so no idea. Yeah, cool. Okay, uh, nice. Thanks for your answer. That that yeah, completely solves that. Thank you. <laughs> okay, sure. Cool. Hello. Hi, Salma. Uh, hi, hi, Dr. Danny. Uh, first of all, congratulations for your nice, very nice and informative talk. Okay, Thanks. so actually I'm uh, quite impressed with the, uh, the, 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 the figures eh? the, the, to show the interaction between the uh, bat flies and also the, uh, the bat hosts. Okay, so show you that a lot of uh, research, a eh? lot of research, a lot of study has been conducted to make that very valuable information. Okay, so my question is, uh, what is the, uh, do you measure, okay, because you're comparing between Panama and also uh, the other places in the world, and do you measure the, the, the percentage of uh, endemisms of the Labolianus? Labolinealis species uh, <laughs> on that uh, particular uh, in both uh, in both uh, areas, Danny, uh, Dr. Danny. It's a good question, and I think I think this is why I'm calling, um, and I just keep on doing that until we have a larger data set. Just I keep calling for for more collections at this point because I don't think we can say that certain species are endemic for a certain area. Or locality because we just for some species we just have like one or two specimens so how much how how much can you say about endemism if you mm -hmm. only have have that small amount of taxa but yes it's one of the questions that i would like to to have find an answer to uh, at some point mm -hmm. um so so yeah great question but we're not there yet to reply <laughs> uh, okay thank you thank you dr Nenny. You're welcome. And thanks for joining, Salma. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Denny. Hi. Hi, I'm Azniza from UMS, Sabah. So my mm -hmm. question was from, from your bed host. Um, where where most of the hosts of the fungi? Is this uh, the fruit beds or the insectivorous beds? Because I'm also co collecting at the parasite and haven't yet encountered none of them with the fungi yet. But now I'm looking forward. <laughs> Instead of only collecting ectoparasite, I uh, will check on the fungi as well. But from your samples, uh, what what type of bats that harbor these fungi? Oh, I see. Um, well, um, so mostly I, I, my work has focused on the neotropics uh, thus far. So I the most of, most of the bats that have bat flies that have the fungus um are in the philostomidae so those are the leaf nose the the ones with a large leaf nose um, um new world bats in the old world i would have to check if you want you you know feel free to just send me your email and i can send you the the specific families um uh, i can do that but I, I i don't have that information on on hand right now okay thank you so much talk to you soon yeah thanks Um, if, if there's no one else, I might ask another question, if that's okay. Sure. <laughs> cool. And you, so you, 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 you say that, um, so, so sometimes the, the fungi have a negative effect on their hosts. Sometimes maybe it's more a sort of commensal interaction where the fungus benefits, but there's no, there's no, no negative effect for the host. I wonder if there's any way that there might ever be a positive effect of the fungus on the host. It seems kind yeah. of a bit there, but... Um, 
And, and so there is actually one other study done that's using um, some sort of bioassays uh, from a couple of years ago by a group in Germany. They tested um, the effect of labulbenia, some sort of labulbenia on ants. And they, they tested whether the labulbenia, um, how the labulbenia interacts with an entomopathogen on the ants. And so they found so there was a basically like what we did with the dual fungal infections, mm -hmm. but they did it a little differently. They found they tried to see if the lapool, the ectoparasitic fungus, would help infection mm. with the entomopathogen, or rather not help it. And so they found that actually the the lapool protects against infection with the entomopathogen, and that's actually good because I think the the host would prefer an extra parasite which doesn't directly kill it than mm. an entomopathogen which will for sure kill it right because the entomopathogen just like goes inside and starts you know basically rotting it from the inside out and mm. so and so there is something there so right. yeah it's, interesting super yeah okay. very and i'm and i've always wondered about that paper i like it it's a great paper but i've always wondered about Maybe it's just single, like a, a single point of view. Maybe it's not looking at the whole um, community and then and all of the interactions that are happening. But still, it's interesting to think about that there that there might be some sort of a completely different effect than what we're thinking about. Yeah, yeah. While while considering all of the other sort of possible interactions of the of yes. the insect. Right. Exactly, because indeed you, we're not just looking at you know when when these when these insects live in nature is just not one or two interactions right there's hundreds of organisms out there that interact with each other so yeah I, I suppose we can never do all this in the lab so everything every little bit of research that is added will help in our understanding of these things yeah so a yeah, great question mm, no I really really interesting answer thank you thanks a lot Danny sure so following the Tom uh, question I just have some uh, funny question in my mind. Since uh, Labonia is an infection, would it be possible for the insects to recover from this infection? So, so recover from an entomopathogenic infection? Yeah, from the fungi. Uh, yeah, so yeah. the one thing yeah. is, <coughs> I'm sorry, I'm actually sick. <laughs> I hope you are fine. <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm fine. I'm, actually, I'm already better, but yeah, uh, I still have to cough right. now. Um, no, they do not. So the one thing is once a fungus, a labool fungus attaches to the host, it stays on there. Um, mm. And it seems like there was some research done not too long ago about um, the age of labulbinielis thalli on insects. And they found that some thalli are supposedly, you know, dead or inactive or, or empty, so empty of spores. Um, and some of them start melanizing up, so they, they become kind of like, you know, just um, attachments that are non-living, like on the host, which might impede their movements. But other than that, I don't think there's then any effect anymore um, on the host. But yeah, it seems uh, insects do not recover once they're infected, uh, which is interesting to think about because they all, there is always a buildup of, in, of inoculum, right? So once there is an infection, there will only come more and more and more. So right. in a way, maybe the insect is doomed to to die, mm -hmm. but it depends on number of thalli. So sometimes there's only a single thallus on an insect, and then I don't think there's much effect. Um, in the contrary, mm -hmm. if there's, you know, say 70 thalli on an insect, I think that's probably not very good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right, thanks. Thanks again. Sure. More questions? Well, I guess no more question <laughs> from the floor. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, then uh, Alia. Right. I, I think there's uh, yeah. no more question from sure. the floor. So I would like to thank Dr. Danny again uh, for the talk and also thank you again for all the participants.
that joined the talk and I hope all of you enjoy the talk and uh, you can fill up the feedback form and attendance form for the e-certificate later. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. Okay. Thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Sure. Yeah. Yeah, take care. yeah. See you. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Thanks. Bye. <laughs>